Next, from the Union League Club of Chicago, we hear an address on the new Congress by noted congressional scholar Norman Ornstein, who talks about the shifting political structure in Congress. Mr. Ornstein is introduced by former U.S. Senator Adlai Stevenson. This runs about one hour. This civilized setting for a discussion of our uncivilized politics. <laughs> there are more uh, good friends and dignitaries here than I can begin to uh, mention. Uh, though I should acknowledge the president of the Adlai Stevenson Center, Nancy Stevenson, who is out there. The Stevenson Center is quartered at the uh, family home near Libertyville. Uh, it's now owned by the Lake County Fort Worth District. The center brings practitioners from the real world together uh, to address systemic weaknesses in democratic systems of government, and some not so democratic. 2013 features the 60th anniversary of the truce in the uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, a, a center project in planning will focus on the continuing war in the peninsula and its isolated uh, nuclear north. <clears throat> Any uh, introduction which did our speaker justice would leave no time for our speaker. So suffice it to say, Norman Ornstein is a resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. He has served as an analyst and commentator on CBS News, a columnist for Roll Call newspaper in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, etc. Norman Ornstein has been directly engaged in the political process as senior counselor to the Continuity of Government Commission, continues work on campaign finance reform. He, uh, he incidentally le helped author the uh, McCain-Feingold Act and uh, on, on redistricting and other subjects as co-director of the American Enterprise Institute Brookings Institution Projects. Norm has uh, served on many boards and commissions, including the board of uh, PBS, the Campaign Legal Center, the Center for U.S. Global Engagement, and the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he is recipient of the American Political Science Association's Goodno Award, the National Capital Area Political Science Association's Pi Sigma Alpha Award, and co-winner of the Policy Studies Organization's Hubert Humphrey Award. This uh, brilliant man is the author and co-author of numerous uh, Brooks, <coughs> books which uh, tend to focus on Congress, including the latest, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of, of Extremism. And that's the book which he is signing today. Norm has uh, observed the Congress very closely, always perceptively, at times from within the Congress. Starting more than 40 years ago, he was a prodigious staffer of the Special Senate Committee organized in 1976 to reorganize the Senate. The only such, uh, only successful such attempt in recorded history to do so, he tells me. He also served as a, a valued staffer of the first Senate Ethics Committee. And so it is a very special and personal satisfaction for the chairman of those two <laughs> very special committees to give you Norman Ornstein. What a great pleasure for me uh, to be here, and uh, that took me back, uh, working with Adlai Stevenson at that time on uh, two of the more onerous uh, tasks 
that uh, anybody has to deal with, and thankless tasks. Uh, if you begin to touch the jurisdictions of uh, any senator uh, who chairs a committee or subcommittee, much less talk about eliminating committees, and we eliminated several committees, or removing assignments, it really is akin to snatching children out of a mother's uh, arms, uh, and they never forget it. Uh, decades later, people would uh, up to me with some resentment at what we had done. Uh, but with Adlai Stevenson, you had a man who stood up, did the right thing, and faced tremendous pressures, not just from his colleagues, but a lot of special interests who didn't want to lose their favored status in this process. Uh, and the same was true in the Ethics uh, Committee. And it's uh, clear that while there are, there's another side to uh, the culture of Illinois politics, um, this town uh, and this state have bred a culture of creating just wonderful statesmen and women and people who have been role models for me. And Adley and Nancy fit that category. Uh, Newt Minow, who's here today, uh, is uh, somebody I value as a friend and mentor. Uh, Ab Mikva, who I hope would be here today uh, as well. And uh, just a tremendous list, I think, uh, more than almost any place, including people who are dedicated to trying to make a political system uh, work better. Uh, and of course, it's an auspicious time to be here. We're now 13 days uh, after the election, but we had another uh, terrific anniversary that uh, Newt, I'm sure, celebrated as well. Just a few days ago was the 40th anniversary of Sesame Street. And uh, I called up Big Bird uh, to uh, uh, wish him a happy anniversary. He thanked me, but said the previous Tuesday was a much, much better day uh, for him, <laughs> getting past his near-death experience. Um, it was only 10 days after the election that Florida uh, completed its vote count. <laughs> and uh, just this morning, uh, they announced that they'd found uh, 596 votes for Al Gore in an attic uh, outside Clearwater. <laughs> Too late, uh, I'm afraid, uh, to, uh, to make a difference. Um, I was tempted today, uh, after uh, Mitt Romney's post-election comments, uh, to wear the t-shirt I had made uh, right afterwards. I voted for Barack Obama and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Uh, and I'm still a little resentful. I didn't get any free contraceptives. I mean, what's going on here? Uh, it's all uh, the goodies. Of course, a lot of people shattered by what happened in the election. I called up uh, Karl Rove uh, the day afterward to commiserate, told him that I studied it though and there was good news for him. It turns out depression is fully covered under Obamacare, so <laughs> he'll be okay. Thank you for the wonderful weather uh, here in Chicago. Uh, I've been traveling around a lot. Uh, this is nice, uh, but I uh, came uh, uh, actually just a few days ago. I was uh, in California where it was 82 and foggy, uh, just like Clint Eastwood. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that took me back to one of the seminal moments uh, of the campaign uh, at the Republican uh, convention. And uh, actually, of course, that was a, uh, the weather mattered there. It was dominated by uh, Hurricane Isaac. Uh, Donald Trump had to cancel his ballyhooed appearance at the uh, Republican convention. Nobody ever talks about the good things that hurricanes uh, can, can bring with them. Uh, but my favorite moment uh, came when Herman Cain was interviewed uh, about the weather and a reporter asked him if he remembered Katrina and he said, I never met her, I don't know her, there's no proof anywhere. And uh, there was a bit of an overreaction, I thought it was uh, somewhat over the line when I saw Rick Santorum at the Tampa Zoo gathering up two of every creature. That may have pushed it a little bit much. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I've got a lot more uh, material, uh, but uh, uh, I'm going to uh, actually uh, uh, leave it uh, to intersperse throughout because I don't want to uh, uh, overstay my welcome here at the podium so we can have a, a lot of time for uh, discussion. Um, I'll talk about the election, but first I want to step back a bit and reflect on some of the themes that are in the book uh, that provide a backdrop uh, to a lot of what we saw in the dynamics of the election and that can help us look ahead a little bit to where we might go from here, where the parties go from here and uh, where the president goes facing the challenges of a second term, of which every second term president faces, uh, uh, some uh, which are unique to uh, our particular dynamics. 
and let me say that uh, this book is a different book from most of my previous ones. I've written a lot about Congress, uh, many of the books with my longtime uh, collaborator and uh, partner in a lot of these projects, as uh, Edley said, Tom Mann at Brookings, and mostly over 40 plus years of being immersed in the political process, we have really worked hard to build reputations as people who have no partisan or ideological agenda to pursue. We call them as we see them, we criticize whoever uh, is due uh, criticism. Um, and when we were approached about writing this book by uh, an editor who actually had been involved in the last book we did called The Broken Branch, uh, How Congress is Failing America and uh, uh, How to Get It uh, Back on uh, Track. And I'm also proud to say that uh, your new, at least for the second time, Congressman Foster uh, told me that Reading that book is what motivated him to run for Congress in the first place. He said, oh my God, we've got to change this uh, process. Um, but Tom and I sat back and said, you know, if we're going to do a book right now, and it's got to be done so that it comes out when this next campaign gets underway, it's going to be different because it's a different process now. And it's going to require uh, saying some things that will not go over well with a large number of people. Um, and then we basically said, you know, uh, you build up capital over the years, and what's it for if not to spend it? So it's a blunt book, and it's a book that reflects the reality that we both feel, that in the 43 plus years that we have been immersed in the politics in Washington uh, and the policymaking process, from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other, it's never been this dysfunctional. Um, there's a level of part of an ideological polarization that is simply sharper than we have seen in our lifetimes, and it's become tribal in nature. And tribal is different. If you have ideological differences, uh, even if they're stark ones, and there are certainly different worldviews that our two parties have, and often very distinctly different worldviews, the fact is, the panoply of uh, problems that the society has to uh, deal with, grapple with, and attempt to solve, uh, the vast majority of them are not ideological in nature. They're problems to be solved. You can look pragmatically and find ways to go. And even where there are ideological differences in approach, you can often find that common ground. I was actually struck uh, just a couple of days ago uh, watching Chris Christie uh, on uh, Morning Joe with Randy Weingarten, the head of the teachers union. Uh, you know, not quite as uh, strange perhaps as the bromance between uh, uh, Chris Christie and President Obama um, in that final week of the campaign, which as I watched it I thought was like a cross between I Spy and Laurel and Hardy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Chris Christie and Randy Weingarten uh, don't have a lot in common. She's the head of the teachers union and he has taken on unions in a often direct and sometimes bullying way. But they were there to announce a deal that they had reached, uh, a way to try and get better teaching. And instead of focusing on punishing bad teachers, it was all built around providing financial incentives to good teachers and, you know, with specific uh, landmarks, including innovations in teaching. Uh, greased a bit by uh, money coming in from uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. But Christie was saying, you know, you've got an avenue here and a boulevard and there are different views and sometimes the gulf across that boulevard is very large, but there's always a stripe down the middle. You can find that common ground. So logical polarization per se is not necessarily disastrous, but when it's tribal where your attitude is, if you're for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it yesterday. If you look over the last few years at a health care plan that had all of its roots in conservative philosophy going back to trying to find a market-oriented approach as an alternative to Clinton care in 1993-94, that's the root of this. And when you look at some of the architects of that plan, I was talking with my own home state former senator uh, Dave Dernberger, 
uh, who was one of the architects of that plan when he was in the Senate, along with the late John Chafee, but also uh, Chuck Grassley of Iowa and uh, Orrin Hatch of Utah. And, you know, as recently as five years ago, they were both uh, talking about how they'd supported a mandate, which had come from the Heritage Foundation, supported the exchanges, because the way to avoid a single-payer system, as they saw it, was to have a regulated market with private insurers. And then, if he's for it, we're against it. And the example I often use uh, as uh, just a kind of critical and, uh, and uh, clear one is uh, going back to uh, 2009 when we had a commendable effort at bipartisan cooperation. It was conservative Republican Senator Judd Gregg uh, of New Hampshire joining with moderate Democrat Kent Conrad, a uh, senator from North Dakota, to introduce a resolution to create a commission to deal with our debt problem with teeth. Congressionally mandated, expedited action, whatever they came up with, guaranteed up or down votes without filibusters or delays in the House and Senate. And you look through 2009 and 2010, there wasn't a day that went by, practically speaking, when Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, didn't take to the floor or go on the airwaves or give speeches where he said, you know, we can deal with this fiscal problem. We can solve this crisis. We just need the Greg Conrad Commission. It's the Greg Conrad Commission is the way to go. We can make this work. And usually followed by, if only President Obama would support the Greg Conrad Commission. And then in 2010, President Obama endorsed the Greg Conrad Commission. And shortly thereafter, it came up for a vote in the Senate. Got 53 votes, a majority. But it was filibustered. Fell seven votes short of what it needed. And what do you know, seven original Republican co-sponsors of the Greg Conrad Commission and Mitch McConnell voted to sustain the filibuster and voted against their own bill. If he's for it, we're against it. That's different from what we've seen before. And it reflects a whole set of dynamics and realities, some of which go back 50 years or more, that changed our parties from what were big tents, with most of the members congregated somewhere near the middle, to where they are now, which is, as we say in the book, uh, which makes a great holiday gift. Uh, I don't want you to forget that. Um, any holiday. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> got a bar mitzvah coming up, grandchild, Betty Lou. Uh, but parties have become like parliamentary parties. They're oppositional in nature. Uh, they have stark differences. Uh, they vote in opposite ways. That's perfectly fine in a parliamentary system and a parliamentary culture. And as you know, in a parliamentary system, basically, you have a majority party that gets elected and they enact a program. And the minority noisily, vociferously, sometimes bitterly opposes, tries everything they can to block it, but they can't. The public accepts the legitimacy of those actions, even if they don't like them. Uh, now in Britain, you have a minority government doing very controversial things, I think wrong-headed things, because they're pushing much greater austerity in the face of a downturn, and it's not working. And you got demonstrations in the streets and all of that, but. I had a chat with the British ambassador a couple of months ago, and he said, and I said, and he agreed that you know the British public accepts that they're legitimate in making those policies, and they know they've got an opportunity in a couple of years to hold them accountable one way or the other. But it doesn't work in a culture and system such as ours. Ours wasn't designed to function that way. Now, it never looks good, and it wasn't supposed to look good. And that's the title of the book. It's worse than it looks. You know, we don't have a system that was designed where everybody is going to join hands around the campfire and sing Kumbaya and we'll all agree on everything. But our system was designed to work in a different way. Not only because we don't have an election where there's a majority that comes in and can implement a program. You can have a separate house, a separate senate, a separate White House, and they all have independent roots even if they are part of the same party. But the whole dynamic was set up differently. Our framers created a Congress, not a parliament. It's not just a different word, it's a different connotation. Mm -hmm. Congress comes from the Latin word meaning to come together. Parliament from the French word parler, to speak. In a parliamentary system, the parliament is the agent of the government, basically. 
In our system, the idea was you take these people from these widely disparate areas with different backgrounds and living radically different lives from rural to urban, bring them together, and they meet face to face, representing uh, their constituents, and talk and debate and deliberate, put themselves in other people's shoes, understand that you can have a completely different point of view because of where you're coming from or the people you represent, and over time try and develop a leadership consensus so that you can sell a public on the pain that is going to be required in return for something that you can promise them will likely be a greater gain uh, over the longer period of time. That's a challenge for any government and any culture, but they saw it as particularly great given ours. Uh, if you don't have that broad leadership consensus, even if you have a party that has the reins of power and can jam things through against the determined opposition of a minority, you're going to be on shaky ground because you're likely to have the side that loses viewing the outcomes as illegitimate and often using whatever power they have to delegitimize. And that's what happened effectively in the first two years of the Obama administration, as you had in particular a Republican Party acting like a determined parliamentary minority, but with an added twist in our system as well, because here you had one party with the House, the Senate, the White House, but all of a sudden the Senate raised the bar to 60 votes, which had never happened before on routine matters, and used it simply as a weapon of obstruction, not as a minority that felt intensely about an issue of great national concern and was willing to uh, go on the floor and talk for days or weeks to get their viewpoint across, but on matters that passed ultimately unanimously or nominations that passed unanimously because you can stretch a time and use up the most precious commodity of the Senate. And even when Democrats and the President managed to get over that bar of 60, we saw the delegitimization process begin, and that is not an effective or good way to run a political system. But then, of course, you can end up with the worst case, which is what we've had for the last two years, which is divided government, something that doesn't happen in a parliamentary system, with uh, a determined uh, minority party. Now, there's another twist on this, which gets back to where I started, which was the difficult part of this. Because the easy thing to do is to say we've got two parties that are uh, acting like parliamentary parties and they're both the same and they both move from the center towards their extremes. But the fundamental reality is that this is not symmetric polarization, it's asymmetric. The Democrats have moved. They have lost a sizable share of those southern conservative Democrats that were prominent when I first came to Washington in 1969 we call them boll weevils for that insect that infects cotton in the South. And they made up 40% or more of the Democratic Party. And now they're down to 10% or so. We've changed the name to Blue Dogs. The Republican Party had a smaller, maybe 25%, uh, share of moderate and liberal Republicans. We call them gypsy moths for that bug that infects hardwood trees in the Northeast. They're gone completely. If you use the football field analogy, back 20 and 30 years ago, most members of Congress would be somewhere near the midfield area and quite a bit of admixture between the two. Now the Democratic Party is probably down roughly around the 30-yard line on its side, and the Republicans are behind their own goalpost. The party has moved dramatically, and frankly, the center of gravity has not been a conservative party, it's been radical in its nature. And if you put that radicalism together with, in the new era of the permanent campaign, where every election could easily result in a change in minorities, House, Senate, and White House, in an evenly divided country, making the stakes higher. So every action goes through that lens of how you can improve your standing to win a majority or keep a majority. And put that together with the kind of ruthless pragmatism that a Mitch McConnell would have, along with a remarkable candor, a whole string of comments that I could quote, but especially, of course, the famous one, repeated multiple times, my number one goal is to make Barack Obama a one-term president. And we know that it was a strategy devised before any actions were taken. 
We know from another book by Robert Draper, a journalist, that on inaugural eve 2009, a group of Republican leaders, including Paul Ryan and Eric Cantor uh, and John Kyle, along with Newt Gingrich and Frank Luntz and some others, met for dinner at the caucus room in Washington. All around the town, parties and celebrations going on. They were dejected, demoralized, depressed, disillusioned. They'd lost the second consecutive election by a big margin in a row, but they came away from that evening exhilarated because they'd figured out what they were going to do. They were going to be a parliamentary minority and vote against everything and try and block it all, and it worked like a charm in 2010 in terms of winning seats and winning traction. And they tried to parlay that into 2012, where it didn't work like a charm. And now, in part because you had a Republican Party leadership going into, and strategists going into Election Eve, and well into Election Eve, believing that the world had turned in their favor and they were going to win handily. And it wasn't just the Karl Roves and the Dick Morrises. It was even Romney's own pollsters privately saying, we've got the, a new electorate. It's the same one we had in 2010. Their side won't turn out. Our side's going to turn out in big numbers. We're going to win in a walk. And it's one thing if you prepared yourself that it isn't going to go your way. If you think you're going to win, and you're already measuring the drapes in the Oval Office uh, or thinking about how you'll jockey for a particular office near the Oval Office and you find out you've lost, it's like a two by four across your forehead. So there's a rethinking going on and a realization now as they've looked at the exit polls that you've got a Republican Party that's lost young voters, that's lost uh, women, uh, now, it used to be the case we had a big gender gap, and I would say, yeah, Republicans have a problem with women, but Democrats have a problem with men, and they still do. But one side has 53 to 55 percent of the electorate, and the other side has 45 to 47 percent. So you'd rather be on the 53 to 55 percent side. And the same is true with the age gap, with the marriage gap where the society is changing. It's true, obviously, with minority voters and not just Hispanics. Now a larger group of Hispanics as younger been moving in a different direction than their elders, putting Florida in jeopardy of becoming a democratic uh, state yet again and not even a purple one. It's Asian Americans who voted in larger numbers for uh, Obama than Hispanics did. And Republicans were jolted by that in particular because they saw Asian voters as an upwardly mobile professional group who would resonate to this message, a uh, simple one, government bad, enterprise good, without realizing that that was not a message that would work for immigrant groups who've gotten a hand up, came here because of government, were able to establish a base so that they could use their talents to emerge uh, as uh, forces in the society and with productive lives and don't view government in quite the same simple fashion. And that rethinking also gets to the strategy of obstructing for the sake of obstruction or obstructing to delegitimize people in power and saying, you know, it'll uh, cost some bloodshed in the short run. But after all, we're doing a revolution here. And once we get power, we can implement those changes and then everybody will uh, uh, feel and taste and breathe freedom for the first time and all will be fine. It was a little bit reminiscent of the theory that we bring down Saddam and they'll breathe freedom for the first time and all will work well. Uh, but it didn't work uh, in this case either. And now uh, the strategies are being rethought and that's why we're seeing these warm uh, discussions, at least to start with, on the fiscal cliff and the larger debt problems. We're far from resolving them. And the fact is this last election did not lance the boil or break the fever. The dysfunction is still there. It's still deep. It's not just a part of uh, a bunch of political actors losing an election and saying, oh, we've got to rethink what we're going to do, or leaders taking a different approach. This is now embedded in our culture. It is amplified by a tribal media. If we had a vast wasteland when it comes to political discourse in 1961, I don't know what to call this, Newt, uh, but it's far more troubling 
uh, in a lot of ways because this is not like the partisan media of the 19th century. It has a breadth, a depth, an immediacy, and a reach that is so much greater. And then the amplification of the social media that's d driving us into two different worlds where we share different facts. Uh, that makes it difficult. This is all metastasized to states where state legislatures and governors now have the same kinds of problems. We have a money system that is so thoroughly corrupt and out of control, and it is now dominated also by extremists so that people who are in power have to worry about their primaries, including Mitch McConnell in 2014, uh, among many others. We're not out of this, but there is a different approach that could lead us through in a, in a different way. And it's perhaps no more stunning than when you think about immigration that went from what I would have said was a 10% chance of having something comprehensive dealt with at all in the coming year or two to now probably 80% chance. Although it also reflects, uh, uh, I'll just uh, wrap up in a couple of minutes, uh, some other realities. You have a Republican Party, I think, that has now three strains striving to define the new narrative and set the agenda. One is uh, the diehards, the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, who basically came out after the election and said, never give up, never surrender, don't change a thing, and you know, among other things, we don't need to worry about minorities. You know, they say that we uh, uh, are uh, uh, racist. Uh, we've got Clarence Thomas. That's all we need to say. Um, to the Sean Hannity, Charles Krauthammer, uh, 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 people who ha say, look, flip the one switch, pass an immigration bill, change amnesty from a seven or four letter word to a good seven letter word, and we'll win back enough Hispanic votes, we can get 50.1%, we don't need to do anything else, which I think is a serious uh, uh, misstep if you're trying to reach out to a broader electorate and create anything other than a permanent minority party that can only win elections when things are so bad that people say anything would be better than this. Two, the pragmatic conservatives, which include the Jeb Bushes uh, of the world and uh, the Chris Christie's uh, and perhaps, although it's not clear yet, the Bobby Jindals, um, the uh, 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 former governors and current governors uh, generally who have a more pragmatic view who say we, we're going to have to rethink a few things. It doesn't mean we abandon conservatism. And frankly, I don't want to see a Republican Party disappear. I want a vibrant, active party that's going to be a conservative party. But it can be a conservative party that is well within the mainstream and that also has room for a fourth element that I haven't even mentioned because they're not a part of the conversation, which is the traditional moderate Republicans, people who are fiscally conservative, socially more moderate, but also in being fiscally conservative, it's not let's take a meat ax to everything in government, it's let's look surgically at where we can reduce waste, deal with things in a different way or maybe reduce the size of government, but preserve basic functions that include a safety net for people who need it when they're in trouble, a hand up, taking care of public safety and homeland security. And when you look at budgets like the Ryan budget, frankly, which don't take into account a lot of those needs, it's across the board, we're gonna cut it back, that won't make it. But people who view it in a different way, including as I was discussing with David Cohen and others earlier, uh, great Illinoisans like John Porter, uh, no longer in Congress, aren't a part of this conversation. Where it goes, I'm just not sure. But I do know that when we live in a world where the Club for Growth has basically said there's a $3 million bounty on the head of any Republican who votes to increase taxes in a primary, in a world where almost half the Tea Party freshmen were challenged in primaries because they were too moderate, they'd gone Washington. In a world where Lindsey Graham is the number one target of the Club for Growth, which said it will spend whatever it takes to knock him off, it's a big challenge, and it remains. And it's a big challenge for a president moving into a second term. There's one good twist to this. I've been a, uh, not happy with the 22nd Amendment uh, to the Constitution that limits presidents to two terms. I don't like term limits, period. But I think having a president 
who could always run a third time, even if the tradition, Franklin Roosevelt aside, was you wouldn't, gave him more political leverage. People knew that he might be around. This time, given the McConnell rule, it may be that knowing that Barack Obama is only going to be there for four more years, the incentive to try and delegitimize his presidency so you can keep him from winning a third term may give him a little clout. But a lot of the other problems that second term presidents have and the challenges remain. It remains a challenge to be able to come up with and invigorate a new agenda after what you've accomplished and the things that you haven't accomplished become harder to do. To get people to pay attention and to suggest that you can have a new beginning and a giant step and there are areas including fixing the sickness in our political process where a man who was a reformer in the state senate and a reformer in the senate but didn't do much in his first term can now step forward and one of the things I would like to see him do is create a new uh, Hoover Commission. Uh, not one that just looks at the nature of the executive branch, but looks at our politics, root and branch, and develops a national conversation across all lines about what we can do to make a voting system work. The idea that you have eight-hour lines, that you begin to have principles that voting should be made harder for people rather than easier, that we are this close to another 2000 buckle, and we have done almost nothing to resolve it that we have the problem of the filibuster in the Senate, that we have a campaign finance system that breeds corruption beyond anything we've seen since the Gilded Age and may uh, soon overshadow that, and that amplifies the role of extreme elements, that we have a primary and uh, general election process that focuses on turning out your own base, usually by scaring the crap out of them, and suppressing the other sides, or that gives an overweening influence to a small fringe group that can nominate candidates who may be utterly unacceptable to the public, and Republicans have probably lost five to six Senate seats that would have given them a majority because that party process, primary process nominated lunatics uh, for the Senate who didn't win, but some of them do win, is not a good way to go, and it intimidates others who are there. All of those things and more need to be examined. At the same time, we're focusing on Barack Obama's problem with Republicans. I should add that usually a second term president has major headaches from his own base. What happens with a successful president who wins a second term is first, he avoids the one pitfall that's almost always a killer, which is a serious primary challenge to his own renomination that debilitates him, forces him to spend money, divides the party, and pushes him out to one extreme or the other. Go back to Jerry Ford and Ronald Reagan, to George Herbert Walker Bush and Pat Buchanan, and of course to Jimmy Carter and uh, uh, Ted Kennedy. Presidents who avoid it do so by getting their base to accept the reality that you know, you got headaches out there and you got to run for re-election. You got to appeal to a larger electorate. But implicit in that is once you win, you're freed from those shackles and you can give them everything they want. But you can't, practically speaking. That's not the nature of the American political system. And so for President Obama, one of his great challenges is going to be to make sure that his base, members of Congress, in a House and Senate where Democrats have become more liberal, Outside groups, like labor, which didn't get much of anything on its wish list, and now is going to want something more. Finding an agreement on the fiscal issue that almost inevitably is going to have to include some significant changes in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid as part of a larger bargain to make it through. If you can't keep your own base with you, then you're going to have difficulty, and that lame duck problem worsens. Now, I think you, uh, what we saw, and I as others were particularly struck with the video of President Obama meeting with his staff and breaking down and crying, is a president who now realizes the full weight of what this victory means and that this is his moment to make history and to go down in history. And I think he will want to have both an expansive agenda, will take a new approach to dealing with the other side, and will also find ways uh, to make things happen. But the challenges are great, and the problems in the political arena 
the pathologies that led us to write a book that has uh, made some enemies along the way uh, have to be dealt with if we're going to be able to resolve these larger problems down the road. And I would just add, of course there are problems in getting our fiscal house in order. Uh, those are big ones. Of course there are problems like immigration. and You can't have a society that will function if we don't deal with those issues and, and if at some point we don't realize that the great strength of this country that moved it to being the greatest nation in the world and the dominant power is immigration. It's all those people coming in, including my family and many of yours, who came here because they wanted to fulfill the American dream. They have all the values that you would want to have. Uh, that, but it also gets to other challenges that come in a global society and economy. We're going to have lots of jobs at the bottom end of the scale. There will always be jobs for people to work in restaurants, uh, to clean offices and the like. There will be jobs at the upper end, many of which are still out there and are going wanting because we don't have the trained people to do them. The jobs in the middle are going to be harder to come by. A new study today suggesting we're seeing a flowering in manufacturing, but it's not going to result in manufacturing jobs. Law firms all around the country are starting to outsource paralegal work to India and get trained people who can do the same stuff cheaper. You get these innovations in place the technological innovations, and they get leverage during difficult economic times, but it doesn't mean you forget them in the future. And if we don't begin to create good jobs for people in the middle, if we don't deal with the challenge that comes with a lot of young people through this difficult economic time, and we're doing better, by the way, uh, it, than most uh, downturns caused by uh, a financial crisis, but if we don't begin to figure out how we can take young people who've been pushed off their career ladders at the early stages, and we know from a lot of history if you're kept off for a while, you never get to the same rung that you would otherwise, and you have pathologies in their lives. If we can't find ways to come together to deal with some of those issues, with the climate, with energy problems, where there is lots of common ground, but dysfunction moves us apart, uh, then I'm going to have to write the next book, uh, which would be called Run for Your Lives. <laughs> and with that, I'm open to questions or comments. I, I, yeah, and I think the answer is um, the fact that we now have uh, unlimited money that can come in from almost any source uh, and bypass the traditional outlets weakens the parties. Frankly, I think it's part of a longer term strategy by people who want to uh, take us even past the whole notion of a wild, wild west in our campaign system. They want to say now, well, we had Citizens United, and guess what? That's weakened the parties. So what we've got to do is let parties have uh, the ability to gather unlimited contributions. And that means any contribution limits going to individual candidates goes right out the window. This was not the last step by the anti-reformers. It was one of several steps along the way. Uh, McCain-Feingold actually strengthened the parties because the soft money that was being used was not party building at all. It didn't go to grassroots activities, it went to ads, most of which never even mentioned a party. And when you got rid of it, they built networks of small donors. I'm now uh, helping to uh, work for the next generation of reform, which is to empower small donors, including letting parties raise unlimited sums from uh, and give to candidates unlimited sums if it's money that's raised in increments of $250 or less. Um, you know, there's nothing corrupting about people giving 250 bucks um, and with generous matching funds, four or five to one matches. But even that's not going to solve the problem, um, either bring back the parties or eliminate corruption without a change in the Supreme Court. And there is no sign that this Supreme Court will reevaluate Citizens United, rather they're going in the opposite direction. So my suggestion there is a generous retirement fund for Justice Anthony Kennedy. Sure, right now. Lying doesn't bring you any uh, shame or uh, approbation. If you lie and you get caught in a lie, you double down on it and you probably get your own cable television show. Uh, or if you're a political figure, the money comes rolling in and you become a celebrity. Um, 
you, uh, the way to get attention is to say more and more outrageous and bizarre things. Just look at the progression of titles of Ann Coulter's books. And once you get beyond treason, you've got to have uh, quite a level of creativity to keep coming up with something that moves further and further out. And that's not just a problem on one side, but it's amplified on that side. And certainly we saw uh, race come into this. Uh, it's perhaps never far from the surface. I do want to remind you, though, that when Bill Clinton became president, you had editorials in the Wall Street Journal that basically suggested that he was an accessory to murder from the time when he was governor of Arkansas. Attempts to delegitimize presidents or political figures go beyond those issues, but they're there and they're a problem. And I do think that one of the things that happened in the last few years is you had a Republican Party leadership that saw the Tea Party movement emerge, much of it from really good, strong, populist, and perfectly uh, uh, reasonable roots. People unhappy with their leaders, with the direction things were going, with a fear that the, they, they didn't have a good future ahead, but exploited it, including exploiting the darkest sides of it, figuring that once we get power out of this, we can turn around and co-opt them. Well, you got a real question now as to who the co-opters and who the co-optees are, and real evident direction. Uh, one thing that demonstrates the problem and then demonstrates potentially a slightly better side, you perhaps notice that the majority leader of the Georgia State Senate convened a meeting of all of his Republican colleagues for four hours so that he could explain to them Barack Obama's plot to brainwash America to benefit the United Nations. This is the majority leader of the Senate. And then the members, an hour of it was surreptitiously taped and then released so it became public, but the members had the temerity to claim their per diem that this was an official meeting. But he's no longer now the majority leader of the Senate. So instead of being rewarded, he was demoted, still in the Senate. But, you know, we're not talking about crazy people who are on the fringes that we all know. These are elected leaders. And if you don't start to control that, first of all, it's dangerous to the society. We lose the whole notion that the tribe is America, and it really is us against them. It releases some of the ugliest elements that you can have in, uh, in human nature, and it's dangerous in, uh, in other ways. And that requires opinion leaders, including many in this room, and many who have not spoken up before. It's not just that. There are outrageous statements made by lots of people that they get away with and ought to be told, shame on you, and we need to bring back some public shame for bad behavior. If that doesn't happen, then we're all going to pay a price. And our last question, uh, is it not possible to cause us hope? My name is Don Wood, and uh, I'm, no, I'm retired. Is it not possible to cause a seismic shift in gridlock by somehow getting the politics out of redistricting? And is that at all possible? Yeah. So you're retired, that makes you a, a taker. Uh, okay. <laughs> Getting the, uh, the, the, we're all takers, let's face it. Getting the politics out of redistricting is uh, something I uh, spend time on and uh, have worked very hard state by state to try and change the redistricting process. But there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind. This is a problem. Fixing it is no panacea. We've now got a lot of studies done, including looking at the reality that in this last election, Democrats won a majority of the votes cast for the House nationwide but obviously didn't win a majority of the seats. Now that often happens. Usually what happens is you, you get an amplified number of seats if you win a majority, but it hasn't happened now. Redistricting is a part of it, but another part of it is we have gone through what Bill Bishop has called the great sort. We are sorting ourselves out, and this is a part of the problem with losing the public square. Uh, we're sorting ourselves out into areas where we're surrounded by like-minded people, which just reinforces a lot of these problems. But it means that creating districts that also have some of these other virtues, being compact, taking into account communities of interest, that aren't homogeneous, is very difficult to do. And even if we do that, keep in mind that Bob Bennett, you know, this is a large part of the, what we've seen with the problem of the Republican Party. Bob Bennett, one of the five most conservative members of the Senate, but a problem solver, denied the opportunity to run even for 
uh, uh, the nomination for his own seat in the primary because he had worked with a Democrat on a health care plan. Uh, that wasn't because of redistricting, that was the whole state of Utah with multiple seats. Arlen Specter left the Republican Party because he couldn't win a nomination for a seat he'd held for uh, more than two decades. That wasn't redistricting. That's the larger pathology of a primary process that tilts towards the more extreme elements. We have to deal with this in a larger sense even as we deal with redistricting. But the redistricting process and changing it is a long, tough slog. We're seeing it work in some states, like in California now. Uh, we've had it in uh, Iowa, and it makes a real difference. But we need to go beyond that. And I would just end by saying, one of the things that I believe we can do that's doable is to move more states towards open primaries, where you don't just have an extreme group, but combine that with preference voting where you don't just vote for a candidate, you vote for your second choice and your third choice. When you aggregate them, it means you're not going to have the ability to have a spoiler with a third or fourth candidate, and you're going to have uh, no ability to split the votes on one side and enable another side, maybe with an extreme candidate, to prevail because you aggregate generally towards the center. So there are things we can do even beyond changing the districting process, which is a compelling need, that can maybe move us back to a point where uh, you can get candidates who are not beholden to the extremes every time they run. But we also need to create a culture in both parties, but especially now in one, where problem solving for the nation is the goal, not uh, kinds of attitudes that we have now that drive out the problem solvers, and that's not ideological. Bob Inglis, a free market conservative Republican from South Carolina, Bob Bennett, Dick Luger, they're conservatives by every reasonable standard. And they're bounced, not because of their ideology, but because of their approach to public life. But it's that approach to public life that we need to enhance, not reject. Thank you very much. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.